Sure. Um, before I start, I'd just like to say um, thanks for having me, but also how awesome it is um, that you guys are putting some time aside to actively engage with science communication, social media, and these sort of novel communication strategies because it means that I get a trip to come to France. Um, <laughs> but, but also, I think it's a fundamental part of science and how we operate as scientists and academics, um, and hopefully I can, if you don't already think that, then um, I can convince you of that in the next session or so, um, and also give you some tools and approaches uh, to help us sort of move forwards and, and adapt as a scientist in this kind of changing world of, of communication. So that kind of leads me on to the title of the talk. I kind of played around with a sort of social network strategy and these types of things. I think that's what it's listed as in the program. But actually, I think that, as I mentioned, it's just this fundamental part of academia and research these days that I could, I could have just put science, how to, and just a little bracket for communication. Um, so yeah, moving forward, let's have a look at some of the, the, the take homes that I want to get across before we get any further. Um, the first one being, I kind of alluded to this, is that SciComm should be an integral part of your scientific process, really. It shouldn't be this separate thing. You should view it just as something that is as important as your, as your methodology or the papers that you're writing. It should just be fully integrated in, in how you do things. It's not this separate thing that you can kind of pay lip service to every now and again. Um, so that being said, uh, that sort of attitude change can really get rid of this idea that I hear so often of, I just, I just don't have time for Twitter or like I don't really see time in LinkedIn as being useful for me. Um, I definitely was of that kind of viewpoint uh, a while ago, um, but I think if you really see the value of these things and you reframe how you interact with it, that, can, that idea kind of just completely evaporates. Now that's not to say that you should spend 20 minutes every day doing some tweets. Um, that's more to say that once you have kind of reframed it as a, as a tool that you can use for your research, it doesn't really need to be something that you actively do, it just passively sits within your day-to-day -day operating as, as an academic, as a researcher, as a scientist. Um, that being said, it's moving on to my next one, you do have to be patient with these things. Um, as anything, to see the value in something, you have to spend quite a lot of time with it and around it uh, and using it. Uh, and that can kind of be frustrating and a bit laborious to begin with, but as with anything, once you put the time in, you will see some payback for sure. Um, and when you're doing these things, try not to get bogged down too much in, in the metrics of it, the, the friends, the followers, the likes, the retweets, these sorts of things. Just focus on, on you and the content and, and how you're trying to interact with it. That being said, and this is the last one, do be strategic as, as best you can. I think that's just a good tip for, for life, really, generally, and certainly attacking a PhD or anything. Be strategic with what you're doing, how you're doing things, Think about impact and the motivation behind what you're doing a lot of the time. And if sometimes those metrics can be useful to your goals, then definitely use them. Um, but yeah, strategy is, is super important, definitely when it comes to science communication. Um, so, so we'll back a little bit. Um, set the scene as far as who I am, above being Stuart. Um, I am uh, I'm a PhD student. Uh, I'm in the fourth year, final year of my PhD at the University of Salford. Manchester uh, in the UK. Um, my research has got nothing to do with science communication or any of these sort of fun things, pictures of me showing off at various festivals and in schools and behind the camera and stuff. I, my PhD research is conservation biology. I'm a conservation biologist. That's how I situate myself. I'm a researcher um, and yeah, I do research, but I've kind of got into science communication and in some more abstract modes of science communication and seen the value of it through my sort of academic and professional development. Um, I saw the power of it in about 2011, I think, through sort of this example. Um, Hugh Fernley Wixerstyle is a celebrity chef in the UK. You don't really need to know who he is, he does some mad things, he's got funny glasses. Um, but I don't pay to myself on him. But, um, <laughs> yeah, in 2011, uh, he got hold of um, the common, common fisheries policy discards ban and discards idea, and through a really concerted social media campaign, 
Um, obviously, he's got massive stature and he's got a huge platform, so it's a bit of an extreme example. But through mobilizing the people with ideas that we've been aware of for a while, he essentially single handedly um, changed international European fishing policy through a concerted social media campaign alongside, I think it's four, Channel 4, so, sorry, four sort of terrestrial based television one hour specials <coughs> and some specially designed hashtags, um, things we'll look at later on. But things that people have been talking about in the scientific community for a while essentially was changed over the course of a couple of years through a social media campaign. So this idea of mobilizing the public um, to actually affect change was something that really, really got to me and that's how I started that was my sort of entry point in, but there are loads of different other entry points into this sort of psychon as well. Um, but that was that was mine. Uh, so I think a good place to start, and it's kind of hopefully doesn't seem like I'm teaching the stuff heads, but I think it's something that a lot of people kind of ignore. Um, it's a great place to start is the motivation behind doing what you do, and that's the same for when it comes to science communication. Start with with why, why, what, what motivates me to do what I'm doing and the research that I'm trying to convey. I think a lot of people just feel like they're obliged to do something, just throw it out there, and you can see it just floats as this kind of nothingness really that doesn't have a, a driving point and it kind of gets lost. So definitely start with the motivation behind what you're trying to do when it comes to the, the message that you're trying to communicate. Um, so these are a few things up here that are important to me, but there's lots of other different things up there. So sort of, it might just be obligation you're, you're obligated to perhaps through your institution or the funding body that you're a part of, they are just, as part of your contract, you have to do some science communication. Really, don't treat that as a tick asking exercise, treat that as an opportunity. Um, you also might be obligated, perhaps, you might think morally or ethically, the money that you have come from people's tax paying dollars. And you actually might feel a moral obligation and you should, to the public to sort of tell them what you're doing with their money. Um, so, what else have we got there? Um, to affect change, that's what I was speaking about before, and that's a real sort of strong motivator for me, is the sort of mobilising of the general public to not only empower them, because I feel obliged they need to be empowered as well, like I'm a very, sitting in a very privileged position to have got to where I am and to sit where I sit, um, but also that I think it's actually the best way to get done what I want to get done as well when it comes to being a conservation biologist. Um, personal development. That's an awesome one. Um, being an effective communicator is just a great thing to be able to do. Um, within science, when it comes to telling your story as far as a journal article goes, but even on the day-to-day -day things, being an effective communicator is, a, is an awesome skill just to have. Um, and it certainly allowed me to develop my confidence, my ability to, to tell a story and to be in front of people and to be chatting to you guys right now. I definitely wouldn't be doing this a couple of years ago. Um, and also, yeah, just to develop a field. Um, to move things forward, obviously communication is a vitally important part of that. Okay, so we started with the motivation, why we want to do these things. Um, the next thing is sort of to start looking at how we're going to do that, and I think the next step for me is, is you've got to think of the audience that you're trying to reach. Um, it seems a bit straightforward, but you'd be surprised at how much you see that people have just completely just missed what they're trying to do through not thinking about the audience, they, they won't put any thought into who's going to read it, what message they're going to try and take away from it. Again, they're just throwing it out there with no motivation and with no thought of the audience that they're trying to reach. Um, a good quote that I use quite often, I don't think it's a great fit as a professional sort of science communicator in the UK. He probably wasn't the first person to come up with this as an idea, but certainly where I've pinched it from. Um, if you try and get everyone, you're usually going to get no one. You see these really ambitious kind of campaigns that try to reach every single demographic possible. And in doing so, they've kind of got no one and isolated loads of people all at the same time. It's almost a skill in itself. Um, so if you try and think about who, what the audience is you're trying to reach, that can be a fantastic starting point after you've decided what motivates you to do that. Um, and another one from Greg. Um, once you've got your audience, use that to your advantage. You, you know, you've decided who they are, what they're about. Try and use that to find empathy with them, to try and convey a message that you think might connect with them. Um, so once you've found these bits and pieces, to really hone in on them. You're not going to convert someone to be the same level of expertise as you, 
within the amount of time you have. It's not going to happen. You've been selling this for years. You've probably had an interest in it for even longer. You're not going to chain someone into an expert within the course of a threaded tweet or a YouTube video or, or a lecture or a podcast. So pick on the things that are important to those people and important to your story and really focus in on them. So if you do try and explain everything, you will probably end up explaining nothing. And again, it's something I see time and time and time again. People throwing that too wide with their audience and with what they're trying to explain and just completely using people. So, 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 so. Um, now with that, uh, narrative and storytelling is something that you see a lot kind of within the, the literature for science communication. Um, and it tends to get poo-pooed quite a lot by some of the academics that I've spoken to. Um, I don't really know why, perhaps it seems quite fluffy, uh, I'm not really sure, but it's something that I think is lacking in all of science for the most part, and something that if it was adopted could massively increase the uptake of so many things. As, as people, as humans, we just relate to narrative. We love a good story. Why should that be any different when we're trying to, to, to present our science? It doesn't have to be this boring, bland, formulaic start to finish. Even if it does have to conform to that, say, like in a journal article, like, you can still weave a compelling narrative through <coughs> research and do it. Like the best nature articles weave like a novel almost, and the science is just as robust. And then you see some of the, stuff, the less impactful stuff, and it's just this dry dribble of just, they've just thrown all the results in, tacked in the sort of an introduction and a discussion, and it just kind of doesn't make that much sense, probably even if you sit really closely towards the science. Um, so I think it doesn't have to be something that just is used by TV presenters that are talking about science, but try and weave it into absolutely everything that you do. Um, this paper sort of chats a little bit about it. Um, when you read it, it's so straightforward an idea. We like stories. We've always related to stories. When we were this big, we like stories. That doesn't change. It doesn't become anti or or kind of, yeah. It's, it becomes relevant throughout the rest of our lives. Um, I'm not going to go on about this too much, but definitely sort of do a little bit of reading about sort of the, the things that you can do to increase the, the narrative in what you're doing and how to tell stories. But when you read it, it's just like, a story is something that starts with some characters trying to reach a goal, they have some obstacles in the middle. You can probably weave that into nearly everything that you are doing to a greater or a lesser extent, and it just makes it a much more compelling and engaging thing to present. Um, but so often it just gets neglected. Um, so yeah, if you can take maybe not one thing, but a few things away from this today, as well as the take emphasis at the beginning, like think about the narrative. Always, 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 always think about the narrative. When you start pretty much anything, whether it's a journal article or trying to write a presentation for a group of PhD students, like all over my notes it says like, well, what's the narrative? And if you lose that, then you potentially lose your audience. So um, we'll see how we get on. Um, so kind of moving on from that, when you're thinking about the narrative, what you're trying to tell, and the stories that you're trying to, to purvey, um, if you think it's easy to explain, you're probably not explaining it well enough. Um, we're kind of burdened with this kind of, this, the wisdom and the, and, and the stuff that we have read, so much to the point that our nose are pressed so closely up to the glass, we know exactly how, what's going on in our world. It's to the point where I can speak to you Definitely about phylogenetic diversity and how I can incorporate that into spatial planning to increase the efficacy of conservation biology. It's easy, totally easy. But if you're trying to explain that to a layperson or even someone in your field, you'll probably find that you need to actually put quite a lot of thought into these things. Um, this was kind of presented back to me unintentionally by a friend of mine who's not a PhD student. Um, he's my flatmate, I've lived with him for a couple of years now. And it was a couple of months ago he said to me, he's like, I've known you for about really well in your PhD for about 18 months. It's only in the last couple of months I've really understood what your PhD actually is. Mm -hmm. um, and I spoke to a few of my other PhD peers and their friends, and there seemed to be a consistent theme among my friends. They kind of roughly knew that it was kind of conservation, maybe. Um, but the chats that I was having with them in the pub, and when they asked, what's your PhD about? And they're sitting there going, uh -huh, yeah, nice one, yeah, yeah, totally understand, let's get another beer. Um, they really weren't taking anything in, and that's a fundamental flaw for me and, and, and us as PhD students a lot of the time, um, is these more conversational forums and settings, and our ability to kind of tell people about what we're doing. My friend is just sort of the same demographic as me, university educated, 
Um, and I was chatting to him in a conversational form for <laughs> 18 months before I got through to him what it was that I was actually doing and why that was important. And that was quite alarming to me. Um, so as an exercise, uh, I sort of tried out a few times. I would get people to explain their PhDs to a third party, well, to somebody else, and then get that somebody else to explain the PhD to a third party and see how successful the relaying of information was, almost like Chinese whispers. And most people go in thinking, I, I, I can do this, and then you, they watch their face as they listen to someone explaining their research to someone else and go, that's not what I'm doing at all. Um, and then you do that a few times and you realise the things that you can do well and the stories that you can tell well. And there's nothing more satisfying than being at a party or a social setting and someone asking someone else about your work and then someone else explaining your PhD well. And you're like, yeah, nice one. But it's actually more difficult than you think to get to that stage. And I don't think we give enough weight to how difficult that can be, particularly when we're doing it and we're surrounded by people doing it all the time. So, the narrative I'm trying to weave, we've spoken about the, the motivation for communicating science, um, and then starting off by being audience-led, um, and then thinking about the narrative we might read, weave to that particular audience. Now let's sort of start to look a little bit about what's, what's going on more specifically about around us. Um, so around me and the things that I've seen for sure. The main thing is this massive ecosystem change in pretty much everything, not just within academia, um, just within the way that people absorb information and interact with the world and interact with the news. People don't as much read the newspapers or listen to the radio or, or watch the news. They are absorbing information in these sort of increasingly different formats. Everything from Facebook all the way up to, does anyone on TikTok? Does anyone know what TikTok is? Yeah. Yeah. So there, this is, these formats are just popping up um, and it's kind of up to us to Certainly, at least keep up with what they're doing and the usability of these things. Yo. What is TikTok? So, um, the TikTok is kind of uh, it's like Instagram on steroids. Um, it's just a video sharing platform. So imagine Instagram, but it's just all videos. And yeah. And it started off as um, people doing it for I think it was like lip syncing and this sort of stuff to put down in the track and whatever. But this is, I've seen news outlets start to use TikTok. So this is how people are digesting their information now. And, yeah, is it 10 seconds? Yeah. 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 So the, the, it's, it's that immediacy of these things. Um, so this is the ecosystem in which we have to operate now. Um, and if we're not going to keep up with it, then we're going kind of, to fall short. But it's also not something to think about as something that we have to necessarily keep up with and kind of go, oh, I suppose I'd better, because that's the way it's going. It's a case of going, no, this is an awesome opportunity that provides me so many more outlets than I had before. This isn't a negative thing, this is an awesome thing to interact with. Um, and I, the little sort of Twitter crossed out thing, that doesn't mean I'm not going to talk about Twitter. Um, that's just, have you, do you guys, have you seen this at conferences and things like this before? Yeah, they'll put it up a lot of time on a particular PowerPoint presentation or a poster basically saying, I haven't published this yet, or this is sensitive data, can you please not put it on Twitter? And that's just a massive reflection of how people are disseminating information now. The fact that you have to go, please don't tweet this, just shows the baseness of how people are tweeting things and how people are sharing things. It doesn't go, please can you not send this to BBC News, please don't put this on The Guardian's website, it's saying please don't put this on Twitter, because that is what is going to happen immediately if you have something that is interesting and worth sharing. So I put that up there as a reminder for me to talk about it. Um, but also this is these little reflections about how the ecosystem is changing. Um, and we just see this huge growth, specifically in academia, of academics on social media. Like we, this is, we don't really need to tell you that. Um, but this is where conversations are now happening. This is where collaborations are being made, connections are, are happening. And we have to be visible in these forums as best we can. We need to arm ourselves and understand these things because long gone are the days of collaborations exclusively happening with physical interaction at conferences. That's, that's, that's kind of becomes sort of the, the minority of the way collaborations happen. So we really need to operate within these fields as, as, as best we can and navigate them in a productive way to get the, the most out of them. So that being said, yes, cool. So 
QR codes, they used to be a thing. Um, they're coming back, uh, and this is a, a good example of how being visible and how operating in the sort of social media and digital world um, is something that can be a really, really awesome tool for us. So I don't know if anyone has Twitter on their phone, uh, I don't know if anyone's done this before, but on your profile you've got sort of three little dots in the sort of top right hand corner. If you click on that, you get a QR code for your, um, well I don't know what this QR gets to by the way, it might be something really sketchy, I just pulled it off the internet. <laughs> um, but um, yeah, the, you can get it, does it not? Oh, thank God for that. <laughs> Um, yeah, you can quickly connect with people via Twitter. It does on Instagram as well, and loads of other apps are using this as a way of connecting people. Um, long gone are the days of, of, of business cards at conferences. I mean, I do have business cards in my wallet if you really want one, um, but I think they are they're so bad at doing what they're trying to do. It's not a case that they're getting going, oh, we should probably move away from business cards. A business cards you collect at conferences and you have them in your wallet and they get lost on your desk. For the most part, they don't have a photo on them. Um, some people are savvy and they can have a photo. My institution doesn't even allow me to put my photo on my business card. It's part of like, the policy and the bureaucratic nonsense. I can't put my photo on that. Um, so unless you're going to kind of quickly collect everyone, write a little novel on the back about who they are, the likelihood is the best way to connect with people is going to be via their Twitter accounts, via their LinkedIn accounts. Um, now we're going to move on later on to something that I'm hopefully going to remember to loop back to because collecting lots of people on Twitter can also be problematic and difficult to navigate but I've got a solution for that which makes this little kind of QR collection of people that you meet even more awesome. So hopefully I'm going to come back to that. So yeah, this is what someone said to me the other day when I was chatting about uh, giving this presentation. I said, to ignore social media now is like ignoring email in 1994. Um, I don't even think that's that inflammatory a comment to make at all in the slightest. I just think it's accurate. Like the way that we interact with email now, five, ten years' time, that is, I honestly believe, how we are going to interact with social media. It's going to be the mainstay of how we connect, keep our relationships going, network, um, collaborate, and share and disseminate information. Even now, Email is sort of dipping down, even to the point of what I was just saying about connecting with people at conferences. Fewer people ask for email addresses, more people ask for Twitter, for reasons that hopefully will become evident. Um, a way that I like to think about it a little bit uh, in sort of the uptake or not uptake of social media is does anyone recognize these guys? <laughs> yeah? For those of you who these are. Tinder, and I think one of those Hinge, he says I think, I know full well that's Hinge. <laughs> um, they are internet dating apps, um, people use on their phones predominantly speaking. And I think there's a, an interesting similarity and correlation between how people have viewed and view internet dating as they do perhaps um, using social media as academics. Um, I think if you think about it as trying to connect with people in a meaningful way and meet as many people as possible and increase the likelihood of making a connection with someone. I think it's exactly the same as using social media as an academic as it is to perhaps using um, a dating app as in sort of a romantic, a romantic sense. As an academic, I mean, how many people, how many different people do you interact with on a day-to-day -day basis that you're likely to make that connection with? And then beyond your sort of everyday sphere, there might be a couple of people that might not be worth hooking up with or collaborating with, as it were. Um, then you might go to a conference a couple of times a year again, and then you're going to see a few more people there. Again, not loads. Your supervisor might introduce you to someone that they think is really great, um, but you might not want to make a connection with them. They might not be the best suit for you. But the ability, I would say, of social media is much better than trying to find a connection on Tinder or Hinge or one of these apps. You can go out and actively seek people that have the same viewpoint as you, try and make connections, and try and collaborate, try and share information in a massively useful and productive manner that without these things, you definitely couldn't have. Having Twitter as an academic is so much better than not having Twitter as an academic or any other sort of social media that suits your course. Your mobility to make connections is just dramatically increased. Like you go from the side of it, literally maybe only 50 different people that you might meet in a year that might not have a similar interest to you to however many people you can fathom. Um, so yeah, I use it, definitely. Um, I think in the future,
future, as much as we're going to have weddings now where people go, how did you meet? Are we met on Tinder? And that's going to be a perfectly acceptable thing, and it makes perfect sense. It's going to be, so how did this collaboration start? How did this paper come about? It's like, oh, we, we started chatting on Twitter. That is just going to be the mainstay of how these things happen. And it makes, it makes perfect sense. Um, I think you guys spoke a little bit about this previously today or in like last week. Um, but this sort of idea of being on social media sits within this open access uh, movement, shall we say. Um, and it hasn't become clear already, I think it can provide such empowerment for us as academics. Um, get rid of a lot of the, the mediation that we have through publications or other more traditional forms of getting our information out there. That's not to say that the, the peer review process is, is a bad process, but it definitely has its limitations. Uh, and to be able to kind of self-mediate and uh, democratize how uh, we talk and disseminate information can be an incredibly liberating thing as an academic, particularly if you're not potentially going to write something that is going to sit within the journal very well. Then does that mean it, it can't have any impact or it shouldn't be presented at all? That's the world we used to live in. Um, and that must have been a really crippling way of trying to do science. It's like, well, there's no point in doing that because I can't get it out anywhere, so I'll leave it to one side. Imagine all the stuff that has just been missed by the wayside before these things were things. That being said, democratizing communication does have its issues, of course it does. This being kind of the main one. Um, I'm him specifically, but also the fake news element of this. Um, a lot of people sort of say, well, we have a responsibility to kind of fight this fake news and this dissemination, this dissemination of misinformation. Um, and I think that is an element of it, but I don't think we should go all become sort of keyboard warriors trying to fight people on like flat earthers and the like and attacking people online. I think just through our natural interaction with social media and our uptake and in increasing it, um, integrating it rather into the way that we do things, it's just going to naturally kind of hold up the barrier that we need. Um, I don't think it's a productive way to think about it, sort of defending science in an active kind of way. I think that can be kind of quite a, a detrimental and, and a negative way of trying to deal with this. But I think through a natural uptake, a reframing of how we we view these things, it will just naturally kind of increase or decrease the likelihood of this becoming a problem. And it's always going to be there, and it's something to be aware of, for sure. Cool. So, we've gone through the motivations behind why we should communicate science, then thinking about when we want to do that, the audience we should reach, when we can reach that audience or the side of that audience, the narrative that we want to weave, and then thought a little bit about the ecosystem that we sort of operate within, and how that can be a benefit to us, but how are we actually going to go about doing that? So, kind of, the next bit's a little bit of a how-to, certainly what I'm doing, and what I'm seeing, and the things that I'm viewing, there's a lot out there, for sure, but sort of this is a little bit about what I have learned. Um, so, again, there is so much out there, um, but be strategic in what you are using, Think, go through the process of thinking about your motivation and the audience you're trying to reach and the message that you're trying to tell, the story you're trying to tell, and then be strategic about what you're going to pick. Also, be strategic about what's good for you as a person, what's useful. You might not want to put yourself in front of a, a, a camera and put yourself on YouTube. Um, you might not like the sound of your own voice. I certainly don't like the sound of mine, I'm very sorry. Um, but there might be something out there that kind of lines everything up quite nicely. Um, so be as strategic as you can, and if you can work across platforms, then breathe, but, but don't worry about it, do what is best for you. Nothing is worse than something that's kind of been crowbarred into like, uh, Instagram or, or Facebook. I certainly know if I saw some of my academics on Snapchat, it would just be the most cringe, turn off thing in the world. But if they were going to write interesting articles that sit alongside their research and the conversation, brilliant that's going to have a much bigger impact. So definitely be strategic about what you choose. That being said, me trying to be strategic about the audience that I have in front of me and what we're trying to talk about, um, and some of the things that we're trying to do on social media, collaborate, research, connect, promote these sorts of things. This, I think, for me, is definitely the best jumping off point. Um, 
Some people seem quite resistant to it, um, which hopefully, given what I've said before, should seem kind of silly now. Um, I definitely was a bit resistant to it before. I think a lot of people have put on myself included initially because I thought I had to. It's something that you're an academic, you should have put uh, right on the micro. <laughs> Do I keep talking yeah. in my way? Oh, okay, it's short intermission. Tool. 
Um, and one of the best tools at your disposal and that I use to create this is lists, lists within Twitter. And this, I remembered very proud of myself, to come back to the QR code and collection of things. Lists are where you can uh, basically curate uh, accounts and divide them up in whatever way you want as possible. So, for example, if I was going to a conference, I would probably set up a list, like a requesting conference, set it up, and then immediately when you're connecting with people on your QR code, boot, add to list, bang, you're in the conference section of my Twitter, you're added to that list. Therefore, in this kind of this business card collection kind of way, when you want to come back to people that you met, and you want to try and work out where you met them, you go to the conference, you list down, you see their faces because they've got nice pictures of their faces, not them in the VR uh, situation. Um, and you can store an infinite number of people and contacts. It's become this kind of virtual Rolodex that you can keep on your phone. And it's, it's just, the utility is just brilliant. And it even works for people that kind of are like you and like, Nah, don't really interact with Twitter that much. You have it, which is the first step, which means I can add you to kind of like my, my virtual role index. It means I can still contact you if I need to in the future. If I have an email address, even if you've chatted a little bit, it's probably going to be lost somewhere in my inbox. What was your name again? What was your institution? Like, it's really difficult. You stop kind of trying to control F your archive emails for a person that you met two years ago at a conference that might be useful to the paper writing now. It's a nightmare. Using lists. Is a fantastic tool in combination with TweetDeck. It can allow you to, to, to reformat the way you create your network. So that's, that's one thing, lists. And what you can do with these lists is add them to your TweetDeck. So you can keep an eye on, it doesn't have to be people you collected, that's just one utility of it. You can also just, I've got 666 people I'm following, I can break them down into useful things. So, um, here you guys are. I've, uh, all I did to create this was I went onto the website, found you guys, then Googled you on Twitter basically, and added you to the list. So, this now provides like, my virtual contact list of people that I've met here that I can then add to afterwards. Also, if I'm interested about the world of uh, up and coming academics and the world of secular economy, this is probably going to be a great place to go if you guys are actively involved with it. Um, so, that's lists. Um, another thing that you can add to this is hashtags. So you can follow, does everyone know roughly what a hashtag is? Okay, yeah. So, it's just a way of adding a tag that people can then find. You don't need to read hashtags, they're ways of, of labeling your work so people can find it, like I have done here. So, I don't know what the hashtag is, but I saw a few of you using it, so I added it here just for an example. But I have ones over here. So, for example, everything from general Psycom things that I can follow, uh, and then <laughs> I'm going to end my PhD, so keeping an eye out for what jobs are out there is great. And even just looking here, there are really useful job opportunities in here, just confronting a few hashtags. I follow the university PhDs at the university I'm at, the university news, <coughs> some interesting Psycoms that I like. Um, and the thing that I think is really, really useful is it hasn't already become evident is I also use this for my research. So this is one of the hashtags that I, I follow. I chop and change these around depending on what the research is that I'm doing at the time. Um, but the amount of information that is out there um, without you having to sift through journals or set up very specific Google alerts, which is a great thing that you should all do if you haven't done already, Google alerts are great. But this, I try and think collaboration with that, means that I never miss anything. And the things that sometimes Google Alerts don't pick up on, I can sift through here much, much easier, and I can add hashtags upon hashtags upon hashtags upon hashtags. So this is kind of an, an example that I've sort of set up for you guys. I study phylogenetic diversity. This, this is great. This is some new papers out, which really brought me on, like, not that, like last week, and it goes a little bit further away then. I add another hashtag, kind of, literally I've only found two posts. That being said, this is actually one of the papers that I use a lot, and I found it on Twitter before I was notified about it through social media. People have pre-print some, or say that, oh, look, look for our paper that's coming out here. You can use this as, as a literature search, as a, wait, is that question? Yeah, could you actually explain what a hashtag is? Yeah, so, um, a hashtag is something that you can put into 
So it's used across platforms. Um, it's a way of labeling the work that you're doing so people like me can then come and find out afterwards. So this person here uh, on this, this spring ecology one here, um, they've done this piece of work on publishing biodiversity and conservation, and they've put all the relevant tags that people might be searching for, including biodiversity diversity. So then when I go and search for biodiversity diversity, this paper comes up, it's a way of... But if they didn't put it as a hashtag, would you still find something? Like if someone wrote feel of genetic diversity, no hashtag? It would be a lot more, so it's it, uh, less likely for it to come. You can search for things like that through Twitter, but the way this, this will come up straight away immediately as, as a label, you're going to come up with a lot more noise and garbage uh, and have to sit through a lot more. It's a way to, to clean your searches. Like, like but you might also be missing stuff. Maybe someone put hashtag fellow genetic and then space hashtag diversity. Absolutely, yeah. These are the things that you have to deal with within these. There are other ways around it. This shouldn't be your only source of literature, for sure. You can use operators within Google Scholar, right, to kind of account for that. You can't use operators in quite the same way in Twitter, but you can look for various different combinations. So, for example, I can look for, I can add another list uh, here for. And then I can just put this next. Now, obviously, you're not going to have every single different combination of. Okay. So, yeah, I wouldn't miss things for that hashtag and not this hashtag, for sure. But once you operate within Twitter, you get an understanding for what people are talking about and how they're talking about them. So, you can adapt the way you interact with your search parameters. Like you do anything, you understand, you know the lingo, you know the job, you know what to look out for, you understand what people are using. Um, like I said, this is not a silver bullet for how you should do your research. I'm not saying you should just leave like web of science behind. Um, but this is just something that I think can facilitate the way that you operate, not only for, like I said, about your contacts, but the way you do your research, the way you break down all of this information. Um, so, are these the things that I want to talk about when it comes to Twitter? I think so. If you have any, yes. Is there an app? For Twitter, or is it just a web-based tool? This is a minute. Uh, I only use it on my browser because it's quite difficult to digest on the books. Okay. <laughs> 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 I heard streaming videos. That, that, those are good tips as well. <laughs> <laughs> um, I actually don't know. I don't think. Does anyone have not snap? I don't think there is a Twitter app. I don't think it'd be. I don't think. I can't imagine being on my phone very well because it's so difficult to digest all of this information. Um, so that's a good question that I don't know the answer to that for, but I'm sure there is a very quick way finding out. But uh, later on. Um, so yeah, tweak that use it. So let's go back. This is something that I forgot to talk about. Um, um, I was going to talk about some of these tips and tricks for Twitter. I wanted to give you kind of an insight into the way that I interact with it because I think that's more useful for the amount of time that we have. But if you just Google, if you're unsure, easy tips and tricks to up your profile on Twitter, there's loads out there. Um, I don't have to tell you to Google. This is not necessarily the best or the good, a good one. It's literally just an example. It's the first one I found. I just typed in Psychon Tips Scientist. So there's loads of interesting things out there, but the way to interact with it as far as the tweet deck element and uh, how you can use it to create your contacts and literature search, I think stuff is not as readily available as tips and, and tricks, so that's why I wanted to focus on that. So yeah, um, my tips and tricks, I guess, are the same as lists, hashtags, and tweet deck. Include that combination of things. Um, I think it can be an incredibly powerful tool for you, as well as building a network we spoke about before. Um, as a, a little example uh, of how these things can work, this is a slightly sort of extreme example, um, but I think it's supposed to present the message quite well. This is a friend of mine, Danny Rabiotti, she's well, she's got a PhD now, but when I met her, she was doing her PhD. She had a little bit of an active presence on Twitter, um, and someone asked her out of interest. Um, I think it was a kid, a kid asked her, um, do snakes fart? And she was like, I have no idea. That's a great question. So she put it out to her Twitter community, asked a few people, 
and a few snake specialists got in touch with her, gave her the answer. Um, which I can't remember, I don't know if they do that oh, or not. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I have to read the book. <laughs> um, I'm not on commission, unfortunately. Um, you, this hashtag then started trending and it got picked up by a publisher. She now has three books. Um, I'm not saying if you start using hashtags effectively, you're going to uh, get a publishing contract, um, but it was just a case of she didn't know any snake specialists at all within her field, she works on sort of African wild dogs. She put it into, onto Twitter, she found a few snake specialists, very easy to do, she searched for them, she asked them the question, they gave her the answer, and they started a collaboration that resulted in three publications. And that was very quick from start to finish, it was only a couple of years ago now. Um, so again, yeah, an example of, of the utility of these things. Um, and if you need any more convincing, this is from Nature, uh, Um, yeah, the top five most popular scientific papers from the end of last year. The top one had a massive social media campaign. Um, it was about the decline in uh, North American birds, um, but it had a bespoke hashtag. I mean, it had a website, a YouTube channel, and these things. They had like an op head in like, uh, you know, the New Yorker or something. Um, so, again, an extreme example, but those that are sort of at the top of the field are massively engaging. These things. Um, those of you who are stupid ones will have noticed this. Is this recognised? Does anyone recognise this? No? Has anyone heard of altmetric? No? No, awesome. Um, so, altmetric is a different way of, so far, it's an alternative metric, you'll be surprised to hear, for studying the impact of the work, the work of other people's work. Um, this is just a screenshot. Um, what it does is that anything with a DOI, through some very clever coding, it will find out the impact on Twitter, on social media, how where people are talking about it, how people are talking about it, above the citations that you get. So what you can do is you can go onto the website, which I did beforehand, I did it literally while you guys were sitting here, um, download a little uh, bookmark for you, and then you go to, so I did this a minute ago, go, go, go to Google Scholar, find the paper, or whatever paper you're interested in, then you have this little well, metric thing up here. Click on it, it gives you a score, and then, oops, no, wrong, I do that. Let's try that again. Oh, it wasn't, no, it didn't yet. And you can have, and it's really like sexy looking as well, which is obviously pleasing to the eye. Um, you can talk about, you can see the news outlets that show all of the articles around it, you can see any associated policy documents where people are talking about it on Twitter, the Wikipedia mentions of it, um, absolutely everything over and above the citations that it might have on a traditional kind of Google Scholar score or whatever it might be, the age index of the person that wrote it, or however many times it's been cited. Like, is that a real accurate representation of the impact factor of a piece of work? Absolutely not. Um, this allows you to not only access the impact of the work that you're doing and the work around you, um, you can use it hopefully moving forwards as a way of justifying the impact factor of the work that you have done and you're already doing. Like you might have written a paper and it's only got a couple of citations, but the impact and the reach might be absolutely vast. How are you going to show that to a funder really than like, well, I promise people are reading it in other parts of the world. You can show them this, like sort of a, a relatively empirical way of looking at the impact factor of uh, your work. I mean, like the reason Mendeley or these other citations, the more traditional ones, where you're like, the amount of data behind it is, is massive, absolutely massive. So, um, yeah, interact with metric for sure. Uh, I realise I've been talking for a while now, so I kind of, not wisdom, but then just a few bits, but get a move on. And if you have any more questions, obviously come back to me. So, yeah, look it up. It's, it's absolutely awesome, and the utility of it is fast. Um, here, I'm going to talk a little bit about um, cross pollination of ideas. I mean, hopefully that should kind of be clear. Like the, the forums that you exist in as a, as a scientist and a researcher are kind of limited, um, but the ability to, to work with organisations, to work with other academics in other fields is hugely increased if you operate within social media and within digital platforms. Like you just, there is no replacement for it. Um, you can't interact with these organisations and your spread is sort of <coughs> exponentially increased if you increase if you uh, interact with these types of things. 
uh, I won't labour that point too much. Um, so there are other ways of communicating science um, that I'm really, really, really interested in. So I'm going to sort of indulge myself a little bit. I don't like the video of myself, but it, it's the only one that kind of I have the right to show. Um, and you have to exclude, excuse the facial hair. This is a couple of years ago now. Um, I, I can't do it apparently. Uh, but I've got to give it a go. Um, so we've spoken about social media and Twitter and you guys interacting with that in a kind of in a useful way and reframing it and introducing it into the way that you operate and things moving forward. But there are so many other interesting and cool ways of doing science communication that might be useful to you. One of the main things that I'm massively interested in is the combination of science and art. Um, I was chatting to someone about it at lunch and basically saying that art has been the way that we communicate important ideas for literally millennia. That's the way we have been doing things, whether they be social, political, or whatever. They, art has been a massively important platform for us. It gets the science, and we go, "Now we really don't need that." Like it's, it's to me, it's ludicrous. So there's now this this uptake of art into science to try and tell stories and to try and get messages across. So this is a project um, I created a couple of years ago, and I'm, I promise I'm not being self-indulgent. It was a really cool project that I'm super proud of. Aside from the fish hair. Hi, I'm Stuart, I'm a marine biologist and PhD student at the University of Selfridge Manchester and one of the scientific advisors on the aquarium installation at this year's Manchester Science Festival. Now science communication and public engagement is one of the most powerful and most important tools at the scientific community's disposal. While primary research is vital at moving the world forward in the right direction, without feedback from the support of the engagement with the wider general public, the important scientific changes can falter and cannot move forward as quickly as they perhaps could. Now art is one of the best ways of doing this. Art has always been one of our most important and widely used tools that communicates important ideas and connecting with people. Now that shouldn't be any different when it comes to science, and it's not. So that's why we created this art science installation. It's a collaborative piece between the University of Salford's researchers and its ecosystem and environment research centre and its media city technical team working alongside artist Paul Miller to create an incredibly immersive piece. And it, is, it feels like you're walking in to the environment, you're part of it. It's fantastically immersive and it shows up the majesty of the ocean and the natural environment. But as well as that, it highlights some of the issues that we have with the environment, some of the damage that we're causing to it as humans. And as well as the changes that we can make in our day to day life that can help mitigate this. And also some of the research that's taking place that's trying to tackle some of these issues, both globally but also specifically at the University of Salford itself. Through projects like the Aquarium, at events like the Manchester Science Festival, where arts and science come together, that we can really engage with the population, we can really influence change on a, on a grand scale, and also have brilliant fun while doing it. So yeah, that was a, that was a couple of years ago. Um, we had, I think. So I had count of nearly a thousand people across two days come through there. And it started off as just this kind of this all kind of oh, and it was great to see it from sort of every age kind of hit that kind of impact. And then we've got people talking about plastics and where they bought their seafood um, and these other sort of environmental issues and changes they've made in their day to day life. They were all of a sudden like tell me more, like what's going on? And it was that kind of hook um, that this sort of aquarium uh, allowed us these sort of conversations and these narratives that we could sort of start to weave, which was great. And, and yeah, there's loads of projects out there, so those are things that kind of interest you and definitely engage them as much as possible because they're super powerful tools and yeah, they're great, great fun. Now, one last thing I want to show you uh, is yeah. Um, 
something else that I'm really, really interested in, and uh, moving on from these kind of novel and abstract ways of communicating science, is, uh, is drag and drag performance. Right? Initially, I think, when I started speaking about it, people were kind of maybe a little bit of a, using it as a gimmick. But for me, if it's about telling stories and engaging with people, like drag performers are the, one of the, some of the best people at doing that, at about telling a story, creating a narrative, and getting people to engage with it. Like, it's what they do professionally. Um, so before kind of, uh, I had this thought, or I'd certainly been thinking about this, I was chatting to a friend of mine that I've known for a while, but only met at conferences. Um, he's a, uh, a bee ecologist, he's now based in the States, he's got his PhD now, um, and he has a, uh, a drag persona, Polynesian, um, and at, last year, thanks. At last hour, there it is. Year before last, so at the British Ecological Society's annual meeting, which is the largest coming together of ecologists in the whole of Europe, <laughs> we had from the Science Slam the day before, Pollination did a 10 minute performance about science and ecology, and it was brilliant. And it was just this amazing way of communicating work and engaging people. So I, I encourage you to explore all avenues of, of storytelling and, and communicating with people. If you see someone that can, can grab someone like a comedian, then maybe try and engage them with the work that you're trying to do, because it's, it's an awesome thing. I'm just going to play uh, a few minutes now, just because it's class, just to kind of give you an idea. Phil does a funny thing to the ecologists. I'm in a room full of mostly ecologists, about one errant particle physicist, again, allegedly, and a wayward mathematician. I think we can all admit that 90% of our work goes on just finding field sites that most resemble a holiday. You're allowed to admit it, the fun are in the room, as far as I know why. <laughs> For instance, I recently just spent some time writing a four-page proposal insisting the best place to do honeybee research next year is in the Bahamas in summer. <laughs> some of you rapidly reassessing whether you're going to talk to me at this conference now, aren't you? Don't even get me started on the marine turtle and coral reef people amongst you. We know you don't care about them that much. You just like the tan! So, yeah. <laughs> this is, I mean, it gets a little bit blue after that, so I thought I'd stop it. Uh, but, uh, yeah, uh, it's just a perfect example for me about, I mean, I started by talking about how you can approach these things, uh, and then we spoke about sort of Twitter and how you can engage these things as a useful tool and really integrate it into your day to day. Uh, life as a researcher uh, in a useful way for you and society. Um, but then, yeah, there's so many other things that are out there that are brilliant um, and great things to engage with, just not only because they're fun, but I mean, those are the best things to engage with, because that's what people are going to relate to, right? Um, right, two more things, and I promise I'll finish. Um, just useful things that I've just, you'll look up, they're called, this is called this link tree, which basically is a site which collects all of your online presences. So if you have a LinkedIn and Twitter and Instagram or Snapchat or whatever, there's them all in the same place, so you can share that one link. It's called Linktree, so it's not very big on here. Um, you can chat to me at the end more if, you, if you're interested in it. Um, it's a kind of a, if you don't want to create a website, but you want to be able to give someone sort of this cross-format version of you, um, it's just a one link that will link across absolutely everything. The most basic package is free. Again, I'm not going to commission kind of thing. It's a cool tool, and there's so much digital stuff out there to engage with. That if you keep up to date with it, this is relatively new um, to me, certainly, anyway. Um, yeah, the utility of these things is just going to get sort of greater and greater and greater. Uh, another thing, this will be on slides that I think you guys are going to get at the end, or at later date. Um, a colleague of mine, Andy, has created some cu curated and collated, basically, a a list, essentially. Um, there's an article that goes alongside it, basically, that the A to Z are free to media for academia, basically, and it goes through absolutely everything. And it's a live document that he updates as well. Um, I won't labor through it, but there's loads and loads and loads of stuff in there that's kind of worth looking at. Um, so yeah, that will be on there as well, just to give you a heads up. And uh, one more note, point of note is, you don't have to engage with science communication um, to the level of drag. Um, there are also professional science communicators out there that will take your science and it's their job to kind of effectively communicate it to people. Um, there's some good guys up here, Greg Furt, we need to give him a shout out for the quotes I made from him early on. I won't go into them now, but um, it's just 
to be aware that you don't have to, if that's kind of intimidating as a thing, you might just want to interact with it, use Twitter to collate the people that you've met at conferences and, and look for papers. That's absolutely fine. Do what's comfortable for you. Um, but if you think that it would be useful for you to get in touch with these people, then they're really, really willing to, to work with everyone. And there's loads of people out there that are doing this professionally as science communicators that don't have a specific specialism. So it's worth noting these people exist as well. So yes, these are the take homes that will kind of wrap up nicely. Hopefully some of these make a little bit more sense now than they did before. Um, and yeah, that is me. Thanks very much for your time, guys. I'm going to be here for the rest of the day, this evening, and so tomorrow morning, so if you do have any questions, then you can hunt me down, or I think we, the actual session is, goes on for another 20 minutes, we can chat if you want, or we can chat later over a pint. Yeah, yeah, no, we, have, we have time for questions. Yes, nice. Mm -hmm. So-and-so kind of did well at the half marathon at the weekend. It's kind of nice that he's keeping up with 
what's going on in the ins and outs of these colleagues if they're working from home or even if they're working abroad. So I think some people really enjoy that as a, as a thing that they can do and keep up to date with things. And I like the idea of having a virtual kind of coffee room space where you can understand what's going on. Um, but then people can be very annoying on the internet. <laughs> um, so this is, this is a crystal problem. Um, the, you can't actively encourage people to show their personality, but only the bits that are acceptable to you. Um, the one thing I would say that I think TweetDeck kind of helps me manage is I follow a lot of accounts that are interesting to me personally. Um, so initially I was kind of, do I create another Twitter account that just the beer scene in Manchester, because it's yeah, so yeah. awesome, but it's going to clog up my home screen. So if you create, I have a list here. Yeah, this wasn't actually set up, so I'm thinking about this. Beer. Yeah. <laughs> so I follow yeah. all of the breweries in Manchester on my main Twitter account, but I can deep up, compartmentalize them in my main Twitter account. Yeah. So for me, it's very easy to combine them, because I don't actually tweet personally very often. But as far as it kind of clogging up my, my timeline, as it were, if you use lists and you use Twitter, then follow, just literally you can follow everyone. You're like, brilliant, you're interesting, you're interesting, you're interesting. Put them in your own little box yeah. and then digest it as you, as you see fit. Mm -hmm. um, so I don't know if that answers your question in yeah, 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 yeah. I, I tried to do it like this in the beginning, but then at some point I decided to make a separate professional Twitter account because I was, and I really like Twitter for my personal interests, so music, culture, yeah. uh, I think for the academic one, I found it, that's another question I had. I found that it was taking up too much of my private life because if you're discussing with someone, someone expects an answer. Yeah. Even though it's already late in the evening and you actually want to put it yeah, on. Yeah, yeah. So I made a separate account and sometimes I'm just logging out. You know, yeah. Not doing it. Fascinating one thing to do as well. I try and separate yourself. You're going to be contactable 24 7. And as you get further down your academic career, that's just going to increase. So there is an element of it being able to only interact with it in periods of time because it can be all-consuming and that can be a danger. You don't want to get it to the, you want this to kind of incorporate into your day, not like a, yeah, something that's going to drag you down or turn you off your research. So it's, it's not a clear answer, but there's definitely ways that you can break things up and best manage them for sure. Yeah. So, so we're good. No, no, no. Martin, Martin oh, was there. So Martin, Anna and Kieran. Okay. I'm sorry, I have two questions. No. <laughs> oh no! <laughs> um, sorry, I'm also a little missing. Um, so the first one is, um, yeah, I, I I have to manage like the Facebook, Twitter, and create whatever for uh, the NGO that I had created, but no one cared. <laughs> so I had no friends, um, <laughs> no followers, and I tweeted a bunch, and I posted a ton and I didn't really get too much attention. And then when I do post stuff on Facebook, like because what I did is I would just like copy whatever was posted by the you know the NG, the, the NG, I would I would then share on my own Facebook. But people don't give a fuck about that. I'm sorry, don't care too so much about those things. <laughs> but people are not too interested about those things very often. Like when you say like yeah the planet or whatever, you know, biodiversity is increasing or whatever. Um, it's. It, I don't know why, but I. I just. I. I. I did, um, I'm just thinking. So the question is, how do you get? How do you get more followers and actually get attention? Because sometimes I just think it's like you know I do it as an automatism. Okay, I have a. You know, we went to a conference. We tweet. But really, are we actually getting some people reading us? Like even we. We do hashtags and all the bunch of blah blah. I mean, I knew what a hashtag was. I just want to be sure I actually understood it. <laughs> and then. And then my second question, if it isn't that impactful after all, because no one's really caring about what you're doing, uh, then, 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 then why are we bring so much, like, I feel like this is a really good way to even have less mental sanity when we already have a big, you know, problem to just keep, you know, carrying on with their daily lives and research. <laughs> <laughs> so the inevitable heat that the university would have anyways. Um, yeah, there's, I mean, there was, a, there was a lot there. Um, I think a, a few things I pick out. Um, I agree with you, but like it's it's really difficult, and there's a lot of mess out there, and it can be kind of difficult to navigate and and, and gain followership. And perhaps maybe that followership is kind of only 
pseudo there anyway, um, but I think you can be strategic in, in, in how you approach these things. Um, you can, without trying to quote my own like lecture, if you try and come at these things with, with a clear motivation of not just trying to increase your followership, but trying to work out the content that's important to what you're trying to produce, then these things can naturally increase. And I know perhaps the cynic in the room might be like, well, perhaps it won't. There are things that you can do to increase fellowship almost artificially. Um, there, there's loads of like how to's online, but I think they're uh, a little bit heartless and a bit dry uh, and a bit of a means to an end, and the end is perhaps not that useful to you at all. Um, that being said, sometimes it's better to gain a fellowship that you can then make an impact on. You can kind of grow your followers exponentially. Once you reach a certain point, there's kind of a, a threshold at which things kind of, the triple becomes a core. Um, you can definitely be strategic with, with, with how you want, wanting these things to, to go. Um, and also, as much as it seems like uh, a labor, it's the way that the world is, is operating now. If, if I go onto an NGO website and there isn't a social media page, um, Probably not going to give that much weight necessarily. Maybe that's maybe that's on me. But I think that's the way a lot of people operate. We want to know what, what's the Facebook. We want to see pictures. We want to see tweets. We want to see Instagrams. Um, I work for a, a separate conference that I put up here, um, and it's a big interdisciplinary business and science conference. Um, I've tried to be. I've tried. I have tried to collect all the institutions around it. Um, the ones that don't have a social media presence, I really struggle to interact with and trying to bring on board. I'm trying to actively promote them through the fields that, through the means that I have. And if they don't have a Twitter, then they're kind of they're missing out. I have like a followership of sort of nearly a thousand on that account, of which I can kind of get about twenty thousand impressions. So this is just the amount of times that a particular tweet comes up. Um, there's a direct correlation to that to the, the the traffic that they get to their website and so on and so forth. They don't have a Twitter account, they don't have a social media account. They, they, they miss out on all of that. Um, so I think sometimes it can be kind of disheartening to start off with, but I would definitely, like I said at the beginning, one of the take homes being time, if you put time into it, if you really actively put time into it, the value kind of is, is there. Um, if only to work, if only to collate names, but I think there's so much more to it than that. And flash forward five years time, you're going to be 10 years behind uh, the race if you haven't started to interact with it now in a more active, active way. Because I mean, I, was, I teach the next generation of, like, of, of researchers and they are super literate when it comes to these things. Mm. I learn a lot from them more than the other way around. I just trick them into thinking it was my idea all the way along. Um, so, yeah, I know that's probably sort of a bit of a wishy-washy answer. Um, but I think if you're strategic and you put the time in, then I think you can get a hell of a lot out of it. Again, I know it's a sort of a, a kind of a, a extreme example. I did not mean to click on that link. I don't know what it is. Um, um, but Hugh Fernley Ritter style, the example I used at the beginning, it was genuinely a Twitter campaign. Change international policy. EU common Christian policy was changed as a direct result of a successful Twitter campaign. Now you can scale that down, you can make impact in your local area with these types of things. I've seen it, I've, I've seen it happen around software as a really sort of microcosm scale and scale it all the way up. You don't have to get to that level of impact or fellowship before you can affect change. Anyway, sorry, I kind of didn't answer your question, but I spoke for a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> it's annoying people do that, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> He's asking if you will retweet him. <laughs> That's the least you can do for now. I'll send you a post of my uh, foundation. <laughs> well, I mean, you can you can ask for that. You can be a bit strategic in the way that you do things. You can be like, oh, can you can you post me? You have you have ten thousand followers. Would you mind just saying that? No, people are like, yeah, no worries. People are begging for content on these big on these big sites. You might time like, I've got twenty thousand followers. They probably aren't going to be interested in me. Likelihood is they have someone that's paid full time to sit on Twitter that is begging for content to be given to them. If you give it to them, they're like, thank you. Have you got any more? And like, uh, <laughs> yes. And then all of a sudden you've got like. Retweets in the, in the thousands. Like, there are ways that you can operate to exponentially increase your. Anyway, yes. <laughs> Hi, uh, thanks for your presentation. It's very interesting. Uh, I wonder if you have any 
personal recommendations probably from your own experience on how to manage all of this uh, communication on a daily basis? Like, do you set yourself times like now on my eight hours of work, I go, I'm going to dedicate two hours into communication? Yeah, how is this process of integrating uh, communication activities with your research? and how you make sure it's not in detriment of your research. Because, um, like, yeah, I, this is a conversation we also have with other PhDs in our institute, and sometimes, like, people are a bit uh, skeptical of, like, other researchers who are very active on social media, because they even have the uh, sense that it's a little bit, like, overselling. So, yeah, maybe it's two questions. First of all, how do you manage this? And then how do you, fight or counter-argue this stigma that uh, over-communication is like, not good for your research quality? Um, okay, so uh, firstly, when it comes to time management, uh, uh, there's, a, there's kind of like a uh, sort of soft answer and a hard answer, I guess. The soft one being that I, I look, I make sure I keep up to date with the literature through various other things, but Twitter is one of the things that I use to make sure I keep up to date with these things. Um, on a daily basis, so it's not a case of um, setting time aside, it's just if I was going to go on web sites and Google Scholar to check something, I'm just going to double check it on Twitter as well, um, and then if I see something interesting while I'm there, then I might retweet it or something like that. Um, when it comes to, particularly at the beginning, when you want to try and increase your activity, there are some like tips and tricks that you can use. Um, TweetDeck is a great one for that, so um, you can schedule uh, tweets on here. Um, so if you weren't, I, I don't know if people are aware, but you can basically, I will sit down, perhaps, I've been a bit lazy recently because I've got this other Twitter account I've been focusing on because they pay me, um, but I will sit down on a Sunday evening um, and look for a little bit of content, write a few tweets, it takes me maybe an hour, and then I've got a week's worth of social media presence that I can just switch off from. I don't have to think about, I've ticked my boxes as far as that. Not that I think it should be a tick boxing exercise, but there are definitely these little hacks that you can do to kind of maximize the amount of time on, that you want to be on there, particularly if you want to just keep yourself active and keep your Twitter account ticking over. Um, but for me, yeah, it, initially it starts off as going, right, okay, so I just spend like half an hour looking at these types of things, and then very quickly, as long as you're kind of savvy about it and you don't let it become, our, I did a really productive day's work, eight hours on Twitter, it was great. Um, <laughs> you have to try and integrate it in with that, but if you use it for, so if you've been to conferences or you have lists that you created around certain bits of your field, people that are influencers within what you're doing, then the best way to get information is a lot of the time on, on Twitter as well. Um, so I think, again, the, the, the more you use it, the more you'll value it, and the more the, the greater ease you'll be able to incorporate it into your day without it seeing like something that you have to make time for. But sometimes, perhaps at the beginning, making a little bit of time for that is a good thing, and you'll, it'll pay back. So for me, I don't, I don't separate my day really. Um, I try not to go on it beyond working times, um, but sometimes I will, yeah, put a little bit of time at the beginning of the week, and it'll pay for it for the rest of the week. Um, and then as far as over communication, I think that can you can turn people off. Um, a lot of the time if you are sort of flooding their wall with loads of nonsense. But I often find that for the most part, and this is not my opinion and this might not be related to the people that you're talking about, those people that are like, ah, too much on Twitter is bad, probably don't do enough on Twitter themselves and they're probably going to get left in the wake of sort of the revolution, if one of the less trite term. Mm -hmm. um, and they, these are the people that I think, yeah, aren't getting the most out of what they could from being on social media. I think they're missing out as opposed to people over communicating being a bad thing. I think they usually situate themselves on sort of the more conservative side of things anyway. Um, so yeah, ignore them. Good to go. Good. Uh, so I wonder if you have any particular comments related to, to other, uh, because you talk a lot about Twitter, I already use Twitter myself. Um, I might uh, use something, it's more like LinkedIn, mm -hmm. if you didn't talk much about it and how you relate to that or if you have tips. 
and also about uh, research data, which I also think it's a great tool, especially within the academic community. Yeah, yeah. Um, so yeah, I mean, I, I focused on Twitter because I think it's a, it's a great jumping off point, but it is a jumping off point for me. There is so much else out there that I didn't have time to talk about, um, and I think Twitter is a good place to start because it has other utility that these other platforms also have that you can maybe link in like things like using like hashtags and creating successful narratives. Um, I also use LinkedIn. Um, I think LinkedIn is a is a great uh, partner for a lot of things. I use it as a partner for, for Twitter for me. Uh, if you don't have uh, a website, I think LinkedIn is, is an awesome place that you can kind of create, curate this and curate uh, this CV moving forwards throughout time that I think I try and tell my un the undergrads that I work with to, to get it now and to try and keep it up to date as, as best possible. Um, to give someone your Twitter at a conference is fine and they can kind of get in contact with you, but if you want to tell someone who you are and what you're about and what you've done, Twitter might not actually be that useful at all for you. Um, LinkedIn also has the QR collection thing as well. Um, yeah, I, I really like LinkedIn. Again, initially I was a little bit squirmy about it. I didn't really like it. It had this kind of corporate shine to it, kind of turned me off a little bit, um, particularly with all the sponsors that you can get and the nonsense around it. Um, but with most things, I think once you get over that, like, and you try and be, and try and take the high ground ticket for what it is, they are really, really useful, useful, useful tools. Um, you can kind of curate it to something like Linktree, you can put everything in the same place. ResearchGate is an interesting one. I don't interact with it um, that much, to be honest with you. That's not because I don't think it's a good thing. Um, I think for me, uh, it seems as a forum it's a little bit dry when it comes to sharing academic material. Um, now that's not that's not necessarily a bad thing. I think it's a great way to to communicate the, the publications that you have that are out there. Um, but I wouldn't want to weigh in too much on research here because I don't actually use it that much. Um, and maybe that's a shortcoming of me. Um, but there's just so much out there that it's one of the things that I don't interact with. I, am, I do have a profile. Um, Santiago will tell you that it's not very active because he contacts me on there first and I didn't get back to him. This is, a, this is a bad thing. Maybe I shouldn't have one because if I have one and don't interact with it and people try and interact with me, then I dread to think what's sitting in my inbox there that might be useful. So I should probably either interact with it or delete it. And if you're going to have one of these accounts, people will find you. People will find you on the internet. So either interact with them or delete them would be my advice on that. Um, but yeah, ResearchGate, I wouldn't want to weigh in too much, but from what I see and the email notifications I get, it's quite a good way of keeping up to date with the publications that come out, certainly from my immediate circle. Um, but uh, yeah. Sorry. Uh, I, I have one question. What do you think about the environmental impact of internet activity? <laughs> um, um, yeah. if, if, you, if you're constantly <laughs> tweeting, sending pictures, like you're going to have a massive uh, carbon footprint just with your presence online. Yeah, uh, I think and you said that with a right smile on your face as well as it's going to trip me up, which kind of has. Um, no, no, uh, I think for the most part, that sounds like a bit of a trite answer, but for the greater good, um, I think that there is a lot more good that can come from it. Um, then the, there is going to be a carbon footprint for sure. Um, but is the combination of the de decreased utility in Twitter versus the potential environmental benefits that we can come from conveying messages across the globe? Um, I think it's perhaps a necessary evil. I don't know what the research is as far as if everyone tweeted 20% less, would that make a massive difference? Surely it's the fact that it exists, the problem already is there. Um, so perhaps actually engaging with it and adding an extra point whatever percent to the thing is perhaps worth a payoff. I don't know, to be honest with you, but just as a quick answer to that, yeah, I think that it's something that we should always consider when we're doing anything in any of our actions, but perhaps in this instance, um, for the greater good. I don't know, don't quote on that piece. Less, less, <laughs> less Netflix, more Twitter. <laughs> I mean, you've got to have joy in the world, haven't you? You've got to, you've got to be happy in how we're operating otherwise. Mm -hmm. What's the point? May I talk to you? Yes. Um, I would like to ask you if you have to choose one of the social media because 
it's sometimes it's impossible to be in Facebook and LinkedIn and it's so many. So which one you would you would find would be the most efficient in terms of communication science? And on the other way, um, on the other way, and another question is, do you think? And maybe you talk about that, and I didn't catch up. Sorry for that. Uh, do you think it's a good approach to each time you have a published paper or anything related with your work that you publish to put it in the in the social media? And if that case, sometimes could be too much. Um, I don't know the name, in the best word in English, but could that be seems like too much? Um, like selling the things you are doing? What, what is your opinion? Um, I think, I'll start with the second one first. I, personally, I think yeah, if you do have publications uh, and uh, interesting bits of research, I think that um, self-promotion, I think, can be a good thing. Um, I don't think it necessarily, sometimes I think it can be seen as, <coughs> I don't know, perhaps cheap, um, but I think that's only if it's done incorrectly. Um, I think people, if people are interacting with these social media platforms in order to get information from us, that's what they want. They want us to tell us the things. They follow you uh, as an academic because they want to know what you're up to. Um, so it's, it's your responsibility rather than not wanting to be cheap to, to tell them what's going on in a, in a productive and, and, and useful manner. For sure, there are definitely cheap ways of doing things and better ways of doing things. But people are on these platforms because they want to find out information, so it's, they won't I don't think anyway, they're in the wrong place if they do think that. Um, yeah, it's, you should be putting things up there if you're on there, that's, that's what it's there for. Um, as far as a, um, a good platform, I'm going to kind of cop out here a little bit, um, but I really think it depends on who, the audience that you're trying to reach. Um, I understand that people don't want to have multiple platforms, um, but I think you need to decide on your audience and then decide the platform based on that. I would suggest that if you are uh, an academic and you want and you operate within, certainly within my field, and it's not a million miles away from yours as well, um, I, I, I do think Twitter is, is the best one to have if you want a, social, a specific social media account. Um, but I would stress that if you are trying to interact with um, a community that has a very young population, for example, Twitter might not be the best way to go. Or on the flip side, if you're trying to interact with a sort of a, an elderly community, then actually Facebook or something like that might be something that's more accessible. Um, if you're trying to create a, a community ethos um, and you want a central hub where people can get information, then a Facebook page or a Facebook group can be really useful in a way that Twitter can't really access. So definitely think exactly about if you're only going to come for one, the audience that you're going to interact with the most frequently and what they are likely to interact with. And I would say, broad brush, Twitter's probably going to be the thing that, that people do the most that you have to find with one. Um, but uh, yeah, hopefully Mark Zuckerberg sends the check and you have to see Thank you. Well, no more questions. Thank you, Stuart. Thank you very much.